today we have a very, very inspiring person with us for this episode of Designomics. Welcome, Toby. Toby Balhotra, the poster boy of Make in India, much fetid, much known, a great inspiration personally to me, as well as being chairman of the, the governing council of NID Amravati. We draw great inspiration from you. Today we are here to not just talk about how big your business is, how successful you've made your business, but how you actually be a design evangelist. You are really quintessentially the designomics uh, ambassador, where you've imbibed the values of design, turned them into a management tool, and made a huge success. So I want to hear your story, and I want our viewers to hear this, your story about your great success. Well, thank you, uh, Preeti, and uh, if I may say so, we're just on a journey right now. Uh, more than uh, business accomplishment, size, uh, the thing that I take greatest pleasure and joy in and pride in is the quality of business that we have built uh, in India and overseas. Uh, the kind of customers we have are the best of their breed. So if you look at our customer base, uh, it's BMW, Audi, Daimler, Airbus, Boeing, Bell Helicopter, uh, John Deere, Cummins, some of the best companies. In the Creme de la Creme. Well, Absolutely. And uh, what is critical to being a successful supplier across these industries is your ability to innovate and to create value for these customers. So what we're doing is uh, we're not producing commodities, we're producing very customized products and customized delivery models for each one of these companies. And the reason I uh, separate the two is that when we look at design, a lot of people just think of design as what a product is designed like. What does it look like? What is it? It's form, it's fit, function. function. Yeah. Uh, form, fit, function, which is aesthetic and also performance. That's design. But in terms of the delivery models and the value creation models, mm. There's a bigger design story design thinking. There, is design thinking. So if you look at uh, why we operate manufacturing plants in India, in the US and uh, Germany and UK, uh, a lot of people uh, express surprise up front as to why an Indian company would invest in high cost, in our inverted commas, high cost economies uh, in Europe. Uh, we don't see them as high cost. Uh, so what we've done is we've uh, developed a global delivery model which creates best value for example for Airbus and Boeing. If you take what India is good at, we can train and skill people and have artisanal craftsmanship at a very low cost. We have great engineers, you can, do have, you can have 3D engineering skills at a best value when you're benchmarking across the world. But cost of capital is very high. Uh, you don't have access to the best uh, or certified raw materials that you need for aerospace. And there are certain skill gaps when it comes to using AI and robotics, when you want to have high performance, repetitive production. So what we've done is we've created a hybrid, hybrid delivery model where we have robotized plants in the United Kingdom, producing detailed parts that we then ship to India and where we have artisanal craftsmen building these assembly structures. Uh, a lot of people would think that's counterintuitive. Uh, typical airframe manufacturers, uh, they do the assembly in Western economies and they try and down shift, you know, this the outsource uh, uh, part production to developing countries. What we realized was the cost of capital made it prohibitive to produce high quality parts in India with the investment of the kind of machines that we needed. And if we were to assemble in the West, we are actually going against economics. So we took this business model, turned it on its head and created amazing value for our customers and a good business model for ourselves. 
and uh, it's been incredible. So we've had non-stop growth in aerospace, and I think that's the secret of the success. I think that's fantastic. And what I also heard from you, not just from you, but also your team, is that there is a culture of design thinking. And everybody is encouraged to actually think in that manner, which, which is putting sort of empathy, the customer, the end consumer, as well as bringing in state-of-the-art technology innovations to meet with that need. And to me, that seems like the, 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 the cutting edge which has really what has worked for you. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, one of the interesting uh, things is I've been in the same company for 33 years. And uh, I've been surrounded by people who are very highly qualified, well-educated, or very skilled. My job as CEO has been to, to be customer-focused and to empower my team to take risks and not to fear failure. Um, I think the greatest obstacle in India is that we train children to make no mistakes. And if you don't make mistakes, you cannot succeed beyond the horizons <coughs> that they already have. And I think that's, I think, a mixture of empathy and empowerment. Mm -hmm creates innovation for us. But I also see a lot of uh, out-of-the-box thinking. Uh, the, way, the way you perceive empowerment, uh, you know, listening to a lot of the stories is really interesting. I mean, you are, you are, you are seeing talent and potential where most people would not. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, again, a very interesting uh, design thinking perspective that you bring on board. Yeah. Where do people start switching on uh, all the capabilities they have? If they feel ownership of the business, if they have passion for the business. I think I talked earlier about how one of our innovations on the shop floor is a new machine that was built by a president of our union. And <laughs> I mean, he used he cannibalized all our uh, discarded machines and built a machine which saved a lot of money in of a new investment that does a tremendous job. And uh, I think he actually designed and built a solution for us, although he never went to school. But he knows more about that particular production uh, process than any PhD would because he'd been doing that for 25 years. <laughs> so, that's. So you have to have passion and you have to have empowerment, right? Yeah. So. so tell us a little bit about some of the turning points uh, in your journey, which were design thinking moments, design innovation moments, uh, you know, which would be really uh, relevant to our audience. Well, to begin with, when I was 20 years old, we had no money. So how was I able to finance a business that was already steeped in debt? We went outside the paradigms of how you could finance it. I went out to the trade, not to the OEM market, but the aftermarket, the space market, and was able to get advances, post-dated checks, and uh, delivery schedules for four or five months in advance. I was able to go and talk to a bank manager and say that, you discount these, keep your discount and give me back enough money. So that became an alternative form of working capital at a time when <laughs> capital was scarce. Similarly, going back to supply chain and committing and having a belief system amongst your suppliers that your word was your bond. You start getting credit from them. So we were able to go beyond the traditional banking boundaries to finance a business through external stakeholders who normally wouldn't be giving you credit. So I think that limitation or boundary condition you had allowed you to, to rethink how your business was done. So just purely not from the product or just how you were able to ramp up a business. Mm -hmm. And we keep thinking of such innovative ways to do business. 
to finance ourselves in innovative ways. We partner great companies and, uh, and we build a business that is continuous and people wonder how the small company competes with and small is relative so we do a roughly 250 million dollars of sales but our our competitors are five and six billion dollar companies so relatively we're a minnow and uh, we keep winning orders and we keep doing good stuff so these relationships that you have with such uh, renowned brands uh, you have really scaled up uh, you know your relationships your business relationships with them through this kind of uh, design yeah. thinking isn't it yes do you indeed. want to talk a little bit about that so uh, for example uh, you take uh, take a product i'll tell you uh, about a hydraulic pump that we make we're the world's largest producer of hydraulic air pumps there was a time around 15 or 18 years ago when the technology level in the tractors required an uh, increase in pressure rating from 3000 pounds per square inch psi to 4000 psi and across our industry people started increasing the frame size of the pump mm -hmm. adding more metal so we looked at that and we said can we do it another way and when we looked at it we modified the alloy we actually designed an alloy that had greater longevity, uh, tensile strength, it had uh, better characteristics for containing burst and uh, uh, the strange thing is we use less metal in our 4000 psi pump than in the old 3000 psi pump. Yeah. So when the industry was increasing raw material and increasing cost, we achieved the same result reducing it. It comes from the idea of empathizing with your customer. They wanted more, but they didn't want to pay more. And in trying to achieve that outcome, we found a way to do it even cheaper. <laughs> so, I think, uh, firstly, you know, everybody talks about empathy. Mm -hmm. But empathy is as empathy does. True. As long as it's a feeling, it's a good intention. When we act, that act is real empathy. True. The circle gets closed. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, 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 the true uh, the steps of design thinking, which is empathy to uh, insights to prototype to actual rollout, I think you pretty yeah. much follow the template. It's incredible. Yeah, so you see this building we're in. Mm -hmm. It's a 45,000 square foot innovation center. It's called the GKM Science Center. So we have two design labs on these two floors. We have a material science lab on the first floor. And above us, we have a daycare center for our, the <laughs> children of the girls and ladies who work in uh, Dynamatic. So what we want is to have a situation where people, when they're working, they're not thinking of their homes. They're just thinking of the, of the job. So we have a, daycare center upstairs where uh, one of the engineers here can actually see her child right upstairs on her phone if she wants <laughs> and uh, so she's comforted emotionally yeah. you focus you have two design labs which work directly on uh, one works on customer centric solutions one works on product centric solutions mm -hmm. so one doesn't one empathizes with how to make this product better mm. and maybe lighter, cheaper, mm. more powerful and the second one is just listening to customers and designing stuff that the customer wants and the material science lab is a service center mm. so I think it really works well for us True. and uh, all we've done is create the infra by the way I didn't talk about it we have something called the JKM life center mm -hmm. which is above the other building mm -hmm. We have a badminton court there, oh. we have a table tennis thing there, we have a little banco mat, you know, where you can draw money and do whatever you want. It's basically a place for people to go and hang out. Now, what happens when you create these kind of infrastructures is you dispense with hierarchies. The moment you dispense with hierarchies, how do you dispense with hierarchies? When you are playing sports, it doesn't matter if you're the boss, 
doesn't matter if you're the junior most person. It doesn't matter where you are in the organization. What matters is how good you are at that sport. It destroys hierarchy. So, when you create an organization which removes hierarchical thinking, you've designed yourself for a different type of action. ideation and action and yeah. camaraderie. And I, I think for you, design is a way of life. Yeah. Design is, uh, is, is the entirety of your being, as I can yeah. see it. And every part of your interface with the world seems to be permeated with that. So, you know, where it's, we divide it into a business and, uh, you know, the software parts of business. And of course, I'm, I'm sure all of this is, is connected in a kind of uh, design thinking zone. As you rightly put it, empathy is only an intention, but you've actually worked very hard to bring in all the details and finesse of execution. Right. And I think that's really, really phenomenal. You know, I want to touch a little bit upon the ROI part, and please brag about yeah. you know all the benefits that you derived yeah. uh, for the company. Because design must be understood as a management tool. Yeah. It's not a, just a beautifier. Yeah. It's not the it's not the last phase in the process. It, how it needs to be part of the entire business journey. And how does a business profit from design? And how have you profited from design? So, so design. Uh, firstly, design must make a better product that is more valuable to a customer that pays for it all eventually. The customer pays for everything that we have. And if the product is well designed along with a great delivery model, then you create value that either is shared with the customer, with your employees, with your other stakeholders like suppliers or with your shareholders. And of course, with the government who takes your taxes, right? So you have multiple stakeholders. Now, good design will create enough of a surplus to take care of all your stakeholders. And not just your shareholders, not just your customers, yes. but all stakeholders. To me, that is the first aspect of what we need to do. The second follow-on is how you allocate it fairly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you want to um, you want to build a very long term business, sometimes you not just you, you yourself but your shareholder base mm -hmm. takes an investment call to invest long. But then you get a sticky business that is with you for a generation for the next twenty five years. Mm -hmm. Take the hydraulic pumps for example. We've been in that business for more than three decades mm -hmm. and we're the world's, we, we hold a great franchise, it's just become a cash cow. In the last 10 years we built a really lovely aerospace business. We've still been building it but it's now started throwing cash out. Mm -hmm. So we took one cash flow to generate a second business. Mm -hmm. Now both of them are throwing cash. Mm -hmm. Now the question is how do we use some of this cash flow to convert our foundry business into a third fountain of cash. So in the first cut it's creating value, the second cut is how do you allocate that value and distribute it amongst these stakeholders and I think uh, both are two different things. I think I'm better the first than the second. <laughs> I think I need to, uh, I'm getting older and I need to now start thinking a little shorter than I used to when I was younger. <laughs> so that's that's the thing. But I think we've been very successful in creating value for customers in particular. Yeah. So I think pretty much you've summed it up, which is that design is essentially about building value for all stakeholders. All stakeholders. And I think that in a nutshell yeah. really uh, sort of um, underlines yeah. you know, your thinking and sort of makes people understand yeah. where your success comes from. And your success is truly phenomenal and very, very inspirational as I've said before. I just since you are part of the, you know, the, you're chairing the governing council of the new NID. I just want to talk to you a little bit about your vision uh, for that. Someone like you, eagerly and dynamically, you know, being part of that, uh, is first of all, you know, wonderful. And what made you agree to that, and what what would you want from the institute? Okay, so in 
1999, I became chairman of the National Te Technology Council that then got folded into the CII and became the National Technology Committee of CII. And in my first year, what we did was we partnered with NID and created a design summit for India. Because to me, focusing on technology without design is one of the uh, one of the challenges in India. We we have the ability to engineer great solutions, but they're not elegant, not necessarily elegant, or were not necessarily elegant. And I think uh, it's extraordinarily important to be able to produce stuff that people actually die to get mm -hmm. and then become repeat customers. So along that way I got very involved uh, because I chaired that committee for many years and I continue to chair it right now. And um, one of the things that I realized was Again, the design community in India is a very, very small community. The way we see it, as, as me as an entrepreneur and somebody who was uh, doing some pro bono work in design, was that we really need to have a movement where design becomes an element of our education system from school, from primary school. It should become part of our public procurement policy instead of this L1 buying the ugliest <laughs> bridges in the world, right? Uh, and uh, we need to make it into a movement. So for, for, for me, it was an extraordinary opportunity to chair a National Institute of Design being built in India's most modern city, Amravati, and uh, to have a small role along with designers such as yourself in building an institution. And I think if we can uh, look back in 10 or 15 years, if we can churn out students who can become entrepreneurs, who can become design evangelists, and who can change the way <coughs> India is built, I think we'll have played our role. And that's, that's what it is. Fantastic. Just one last thing before we wrap up. You know, India is at an inflection point. I mean, we are really a country of entrepreneurs. Uh, the number of entrepreneurs which India is throwing up is incredible, very inspiring. Is there a message that you would like to give them from the perspective of being a design evangelist? How to embrace design at early stages to, to you know, to project a, to have a trajectory of success, which is which they instead of doing a catch up later, uh, wherein you have a business model, uh, yeah. and then maybe later you sort of take three yeah. steps back and say maybe I should have designed it better. Yeah. Yeah. Why not actually understand the importance of it from level one? Yeah. So if you look at India, we are at a historic moment. India is the world's largest democracy, and. Uh, it's also a developing country. In the next 20 years, we're going to have the largest mass migration on the planet happening in our country. We're going to have five, six hundred million people going from rural areas to urban. We're going to, in the next 20, 30 years, build more than we have built in the last 5,000 years. It's our moment to build a great India or a terrible India. And the difference between the two is only design. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> well said. <laughs> and I think I could have ended it on a better note, you know, so that, that design being that magic moment for the great future that awaits us. Thank you, Toby, for throwing Thank light you. at uh, on, on this amazing journey of yours and the inspiration that you probably have to all for all the entrepreneurs of the country. Thank you so much for being part of design. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.